Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, on our webinar this afternoon. I'm Michelle Zamparetti. I am a longtime member of the Business Engagement Collaborative and have been working for the past year and a half, uh, running my own company, doing a lot of work in public health program development, implementation and evaluation, as well as leadership development and strategic planning. And I'm excited to be moderating today's webinar, Harvard's Culture of Health, a Business Leadership Imperative Program. Um, this is the first webinar that we're hosting of 2020 that uh, typically we host about four to five webinars a year. The Action Collaborative on Business Engagement in Building Healthy Communities is always excited to bring great speakers and wonderful information to you about what is going on in the, uh, d around the discussion of linking businesses and population and community health. Today, we have a very exciting uh, presentation about the Culture of Health program, and our speakers are Howard Coe and John McDonough, who I will briefly introduce, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to them. If you have questions, please type them into the Zoom group chat, and we will take all the questions at the end in order of how they were submitted. Um, Dr. Howard Coe is the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. He previous, previously served as the 14th Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Ser Human Services after being nominated by President Barack Obama and as Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts after be, being appointed by Governor William Wells. A graduate of Yale College and Yale University School of Medicine, he trained at Boston City Hospital and Mass General Hospital, earning board certifications in four medical fields has been principal investigator of research, research grants totaling 24 million, published more than 275 articles in the medical and public health literature, and has received over 70 awards, including six honorary doctorate degrees. And John McDonough, who is a professor of public health practice in the Department of Health Policy and Management, also at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and director of executive and continuing professional education, in 2010, he was the Joan H. Tisch Distinguished Fellow in Public Health at Hunter College in New York City. Between 2008 and 2010, he served as Senior Advisor on National Health Reform to the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, where he worked on the development and passage of the Affordable Care Act. Between 2003 and 2008, he served as Executive Director of Healthcare for All, Massachusetts' leading consumer health advocacy organization, where he played a key role in passage and implementation of the 2006 Massachusetts Health Reform Law. Between 1998 and 2003, he was an associate professor at the Heller School at Brandeis University and a senior associate at the Schneider Institute for Health Policy. From 1985 to 97, he served as a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives where he co-chaired the Joint Committee on Healthcare. We are very fortunate and very excited to hear both Dr. Coe and Dr. McDonough talk this afternoon about their work in the culture of health. So I'm going to turn it over first to Dr. Howard Coe. Please again, put your questions into the box and we uh, are excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for joining us. Michelle, thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to join the Action Collaborative on this very important webinar. And I'm delighted to share this presentation with my very close colleague, Dr. John McDonough and talk about some grant activities that we've had here at Harvard over the last several years funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, we all know that we have tremendous health challenges in this country and around the world, and we need the best partnerships throughout society to advance uh, what has been called a culture of health. And so several years ago, we were asked by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to help promote this partnership between the worlds of private business and public health, and specific, specifically have the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Business School work more closely together on some very fundamental issues to bring uh, this partnership uh, closer together. So what I'm going to very briefly describe uh, are some of the efforts that we've undertaken, some of the talking points we've adopted in trying to explain what we're doing, 
Uh, some of the outcomes that we have, uh, the, the overall goals were to try to convene people, try to advance investigation in some basic ways, and try to disseminate lessons learned. Uh, John will be talking much more about the executive education parts, but I'll be talking more about some of the general themes that we encountered. Uh, I'm very proud to say that we have um, enjoyed this initial journey very, very much, and the National Academy of Medicine has been uh, tremendously supportive. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have Alina Bachu on our advisory committee, and that's um, one of the many reasons that we're presenting to you today. And Michelle, we thank you for your leadership as well. So thank you very much. So if I can have the first slide. Next slide. So the National Academy of Medicine, of course, is, is a group that's been such a tremendous force in talking about the future of public health in our country talking about uh, health equity as a very important goal for our society, uh, emphasizing uh, that we are a country with uh, many health disparities and that the only way to move forward is to have various sectors working together uh, to talk about social determinants of health and create new partners. Uh, business should be an obvious partner because they have so many resources and so much clout but until relatively recently, as you all well know, we have not talked about the worlds of private business and public health working uh, very closely together. And there are some good reasons why. Uh, next slide. Uh, all you have to do is look at a typical he headline in the paper, either today or in the past, to see that business and health have had a checkered history until now. And we're at a time where CEO reputations are declining. The business community has received lots of criticism over years and decades saying that they've contributed to a lot of the inequities, social uh, and otherwise that we're seeing around the world. There, there's no doubt that businesses have flourished in this country and worldwide but they've also contributed to some of the health challenges that we see, starting with some fundamental areas like tobacco dependence, and you can see other headlines uh, noted here. So for those reasons, there hasn't been that much discussion about potential partnerships in, in this whole area until relatively recently. Next slide. But we, uh, when we started our grant proposal learned from some colleagues who had been thinking about this for quite a while. One in particular is a good colleague of uh, Dr. McDonough and myself, Professor John Quelch, who is now the Dean of Business at the University of Miami. And he's pointed out for years that every business is a health business, whether they realize it or not. Every business has a health impact, either knowingly or not. And here's one example from Professor Quelch's writings, the cruise industry, because if you are Royal Caribbean, for example, you know that a norovirus outbreak can end the cruise early, uh, have tremendous health impacts on your customers, can hurt your profits, uh, causes uh, lots of attention with respect to a cleanup and disinfection and, and prevention for keeping the whole business going forward. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, Royal Caribbean actually established a safety environment and health department for the first time, as you can see here. And uh, the threats of outside forces like norovirus continue to impact on the cruise industry, for example. Even today in the news, you are seeing reports about what coronaviruses have done to the cruise industry. And so this is one of the many examples where the underlying theme is every business is a health business, whether they realize it or not. Next slide. So how do we explain uh, the culture of health concept, which may be familiar to many of you, but is still uh, in traction around the country, if I can say. And after much thought and discussion and also interaction with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation itself, uh, we now realize that the whole global focus on sustainability is a very logical way to explain culture of health activities. So what does sustainability mean? If you go back to the history of farming in this country and around the world, uh, farmers knew from a long time ago that they had to plan for tomorrow as well as today, that they had to use your, their resources carefully to meet the needs of the present 
without comp compromising ability to meet the needs of future generations. So that sustainability theme, which started in the agriculture world is now prominent and applies to all human ac activities. In fact, sustainability applies not just to the planet, but also to its people. Next slide. So if you explain culture of health through a sustainability lens, you can say that this dates back to the late 1980s when the Grove Brooklyn report from WHO defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future gener generations to meet their own needs. What we have come to learn in our collaboration with the business school, and we have some tremendous leaders there uh, who have been pioneers in talking about businesses increasingly reporting so-called non-financial ESG measures, environmental, social, and governance measures. So what that means is that for a century, all businesses have had to produce financial reports, profit and loss, but increasingly also have to report non-financial outcomes, so-called ESG outcomes. And there are now some frameworks like the Global Reporting Initiative and the Sustainability Accounting, Accounting Standards Board that report ESG measures in a transparent fashion to uh, anybody who wants to see uh, such outcomes. So in, the, in this context, in 2015, as you know, the UN unveiled the so-called SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide. And you all know uh, that there are 17 of them now put before the global community with a aspiration to reach these uh, 17 goals by 2030. If you take a look at them and say, okay, how many of these are related to public health? The narrow answer is SDG three, good health and well-being. But the broader answer, if you take a step back, is virtually all of them apply to public health. For example, SDG one, no poverty, SDG two, zero hunger, SDG four, quality education, and so on. So if you view health as true well-being in its broadest sense, which is the way WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, that's the way to look at the SDG goals as well. Next slide. And in fact, if you study this whole area more, as we have had the honor of doing the last couple of years, we see that there's some global momentum. For example, there is now a UN Global Compact for the last several decades. Uh, over 8,000 now, actually over 9,000 companies have signed on to this corporate sustainability initiative that focuses on major ESG themes like human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Uh, we in the public health world have not paid as much attention to the investment world, but there's movement in that area with respect to sustainability as well. For example, in 2005, these principles for responsible investment were put forward that encourages responsible investment strategies incorporating ESG themes. Next slide. Okay, next, next slide, please. And then uh, last year in a very well publicized announcement, the Business Roundtable, which is a US group of some top 180 CEOs, upended a long standing long-standing previous statement of purpose, which said that corporations exist principally to serve their shareholders. In August 2019, as you see here, they updated their statement of purpose, saying that Americans deserve an economy that allows each person to succeed through uh, hard work, creativity, and to lead a, a life of meaning and dignity. And they said in this updated statement that businesses should be paying attention not just to shareholders, but to all stakeholders, that is customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and uh, as well as shareholders. So this announcement captured a lot of attention and a lot of interest to see if businesses now will follow through on their commitments and, and really make sustainability and therefore culture of health a priority going forward. Next slide. So it's in this context that we have been doing our work here at Harvard for the last several years. Uh, we are again grateful to Professor Quelch, a picture of him on the bottom right, who put forward this framework for looking at culture of health. He proposes that businesses can 
advance a culture of health through four pillars, consumer health, employee health, community health, and environmental health. So part of our work is collecting examples of this, publicizing those efforts by businesses, trying to understand why CEOs are moving in this direction. And we have a growing list of examples that we, we share with our audiences. So for consumer health, you all know that in 2014, CVS made history here in the United States by announcing that they were no longer gonna sell tobacco products because they viewed themselves as a health industry. And so they changed their name to CVS Health, Stop Selling Tobacco Products. Uh, that has been very well received and their business actually, actually gone up since they made that announcement. For employee health, we have lots of examples about how companies are doing more to support the well-being of employees. Uh, one that I've been made aware of is more and more companies providing paid parental leave benefits, which simply did not exist a generation ago. For community health, anchor institutions are an area that we're very interested in. I'll be saying more about that. And environmental health in this era of climate change, there are more and more businesses who are either investing in renewable energy or trying to cut down uh, energy usage. And we're seeing that, that trend coast to coast and um, many examples of that to cite. We uh, are starting to write and publish on these areas. And on the left, I put forward this piece for your perusal called Health as a Way of Doing Business came out in JAMA of last year, co-authored by myself, Dr. Sarah Singer, who is another major uh, co-principal investigator on this grant with myself and uh, Dr. McDonough, and also Professor Amy Edmondson of Harvard Business School. Next slide. Now, why do businesses do this? What, what's the motivating philosophy? Our Harvard Business School professors have pushed this theme called creating shared value uh, they say that if you take a historic approach that businesses used to do such work out of simple traditional philanthropy seen on the left, and then over time they move more toward a theme of so-called corporate social responsibility. But in the last 15 years or so, according to professors Porter and Kramer, more companies are moving into creating shared value where they see creating societal benefits just as important as creating economic benefits for the company, uh, that such efforts are integral to profit maximization. And ideally, this can realign the strategies of a company and even their entire budget. So you hit the next one. So if our goals as public health and business partners are to create social value and create business value, According to this theme, if we hit the next slide, businesses like CVS, by stopping selling tobacco, create shared value. They promote good for society and they create uh, advancements for their own business value as well. So that's the underlying philosophy, sort of motivating many of these CEOs who are moving into this whole area. Next slide. And we're very, very excited about that. Now, one of the outcomes of our research collaboration so far is to work with great colleagues like uh, Dr. Tyler Vanderweel noted here. Uh, he is a brilliant epidemiologist and biostatistician, very interested in measuring well-being and has put forward this proposed flourishing index that you can all take uh, by going on the web and looking up this questionnaire and scaling yourself from a zero to a hundred scale, grading yourself on domains of happiness, me mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character, close social relationships and financial stability. Again, he and I and Dr. Eileen McNeely, another member of our grant team uh, wrote this up in JAMA uh, recently. And so when you talk about measuring well-being and measuring culture of health, uh, what are ways to do this reliably and easily and comprehensively? This flourishing index could be one way to, to help that conversation. Next slide. We have also begun to measure how many businesses are actually taking up culture of health related actions. And this is an article that came out in the Millbank Quarterly recently, a research team led by Professor Sarah Singer that showed that uh, some businesses are taking up some culture of health actions as a benchmark, uh, especially for consumers, but we still have a long ways to go. So we are very grateful to be quantitative here and then hopefully we can repeat this 
survey going forward and, and try to demonstrate progress. Next slide. Just recently, uh, last month, we were very happy to publish this article on anchor institutions. Anchor institutions, you may know, are place-based organizations that can't move, and they see their business futures inextricably linked with the communities around them and have decided to invest in them, invest substantial financial and human resources. Uh, if you look at the little literature that's out there, and our article now joins our literature, uh, the terms are universities, anchor eds, and then hospitals and health systems, which are called anchor meds. Uh, this article that we just published last month reviews the status of 42 anchor meds around the country, showing how they invest in their surrounding communities with respect to housing and food insecurity and other ways of promoting a culture of health. Next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, and we've gone through this very, very quickly, but in summary, uh, we like to put forward the concepts that every business is a culture of health business, knowingly or not, that the four pillar framework by Professor Quelch, we believe can help explain culture of health and sustainability in a, in a very coherent way and can also assist businesses with evaluating their impacts and opportunities. Businesses have great potential for good and harm, that the shared value concept helps us again explain the opportunities and our compelling model to encourage businesses to adopt culture of health. Uh, we need better metrics. We believe the flourishing index could, could be one, but there is a great need for more academic research and discussion about how to measure outcomes. But as we advance all these themes, we look forward to working more closely with everybody on this webinar with the National Academy of Medicine, and we thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you so much, Dr. Ko. Um, again, if anyone has questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. You will see, oh, we just got a question. You will see that Alina has kindly put the link to the JAMA article, as well as the Journal of Public Health article. And I will be making um, both Dr. Ko and Dr. McDonough's emails available towards the end of the session so you can email directly to request the slides. We do have one question. Dr. Ko, are there any examples of place-based accountability mechanisms for example, to, for example, assess the extent to which employers provide good jobs in certain localities, jobs that offer a living wage with benefits, for example. Okay, so anchor institutions make the commitment to have themes like that a, a high priority for the way they do business every day. And uh, for example, they try to recruit employees from the surrounding neighborhoods, their, their training programs to to teach skills and try to help promote people who are hired from the community. Uh, there's summer programs to help young people uh, get skills to uh, join a business in, in their future. So far, the anchor institutions activities in, in the US are voluntary, but we, we hope this all advances in the future. And by the way, we're also hoping to look more closely into anchor businesses to see how business uh, institutions promote those same strategies going forward. Is there any effort underway to tax any institutions that do not provide the support or provide good jobs? I, I have not heard of that. Uh, I, I do also want to point out that a lot of the motivations for organizations to do this from a, from a health institution point of view is the Affordable Care Act. And I'm very proud that Dr. McDonough helped write the ACA. But as you know, the ACA requires nonprofit hospitals to uh, do a community health needs assessment every three years and work with the community to implement the highest priorities there. So right now the efforts are trying to uh, make those needs assessments mandatory <laughs> and, and then promote the uh, collaborations that come out of it. And lastly, before we turn it over to Dr. McDonough, um, can you address the impact that having more venture capitalists invest in social determinants of health might have on business engagement? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the investment world is one that we in public health usually don't pay that much attention to, but when you stop and think about it, that could be an incredible force for good. So as more investment firms are looking for companies that have good ESG profiles, good sustainability profiles, that can drive a lot of investment dollars going forward. 
Uh, there are now new investment vehicles be, that are being put forward that um, prioritize companies that that really uh, uphold the ESG, uh, the SDG goals as part of the way they do their work. So uh, we, we think that this is an underdeveloped area that needs more attention uh, moving forward. And when you stop and think about it, pension funds, uh, foundations, they have tremendous resources where they're investing all the time. If they are convinced to invest in companies that really care about the sustainability and culture of health, that, that could make a big impact on society in the future. Great. Thank you, Dr. Koh. Keep the questions coming. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you now, Dr. McDonough. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, and thanks, Howard, for your excellent presentation. And I'm honored to be here and share a little bit. Um, I'd also like to note um, uh, two people who are with us, uh, Nico Pronk and Paul Terry from Hero. Both were very helpful to us um, along the process of this work, uh, particularly in the uh, elements that I've been involved in. Um, so just uh, a brief bit of background. Mm -hmm. When the uh, original discussions were held with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they were interested in us attempting to do some outward facing engagement in terms of reaching out to businesses that might not be familiar with the culture of health concept. And so that's where I was pulled in in my role as the director of executive and continuing professional ed at the Harvard Chan School. And we proposed three particular ideas for the foundation. I'm hoping they might take one of them and they ended up asking us to do all three. So uh, those are the three that I'm gonna describe to you very briefly because we've cycled through and done um, what we intended to do. Can I have the first slide please or the next slide? So um, we did a, a market research study to inform our work in engaging with the business community that involved a survey by a market research firm to develop a sense of awareness of the culture of health concept and some other um, uh, ideas and notions that we wanted to see how well they understood. Uh, we created what's called a MOOC or a massive open online course through our MOOC delivery entity at Harvard University called Harvard X. Uh, and this is improving your business through a culture of health, a, a free uh, nine hours of content um, open course for anyone in the United States and anyone around the world. And I'll give you some uh, indicators of how well that worked. And then we created two on-site, in-person uh, executive training programs on culture of health for executive leaders. Uh, the first one, we invited individuals from companies to come. And it's, uh, it was a two-day program. And, uh, and pretty intense. And that was the first one. And then the second one we did was roughly the same thing with some changes. And we aimed that one for teams from business rather than individuals. So we could assess the differences. So those were our four deliverables for this work. And that's what we came up with. Can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, again, just to not to repeat, but I will repeat because this was the foundation that we used as a teaching tool to businesses and, uh, and relying on culture of health, uh, John Kulch's four pillars. And uh, we added, particularly in our MOOC, a little bit of a fifth frame up at the top, which is you, which is focused on the personal health of the business leaders, executive leaders who engage in this uh, to talk about establishing themselves as role models for their organizations to some extent and strategies in terms of what they can do in their busy lives to take care of themselves as well as all of these other elements. And then of course, leadership is a consistent frame through each of these. Um, one of the things, honestly, if we were to go back and do it again, I'm not wild about the term pillars. Um, but, uh, but that's what Quilch came up with because it suggests almost separate silos. And what, what we've observed in terms of teaching this is that this is a great tool 
that business executives and management leaders and other folks can easily grasp. And it's a way to start just by segmenting, to think about these four pillars, think about your business, what you do now that contributes in a positive way to each of these four dimensions and what you do right now that perhaps has a negative impact and then coming up with strategies potentially on each, starting with where you feel the greatest affinity, the greatest need, the greatest potential impact. Um, but then also as you get more deeply into this then to quickly think about the interrelationships among these four domains, because of course, many of your employees are also your consumers, live in your key communities and are impacted by the environmental consequences of your business and what it does and the kind of footprint that it makes or leaves. So we have one, one of our findings is we found this to be an effective tool that business leaders kind of instinctively get and can then use and can think about very easily and rapidly in relation to their own business. So just, uh, just one important finding. Next slide, please. Um, so our, uh, our market survey, these were some of the key questions uh, that we asked in terms of learning about the, the audience and then attempting to apply the culture of health. You'll have the slides. I'm not gonna dwell on this because I wanna make sure we have enough time for ample discussion. Can I move to the next slide, please? And this is the uh, overview of our market study. And, uh, and what we did, we had a, a professional firm. Uh, we have some of the results in the second bullet in terms of uh, the uh, participation that we had and some of the key findings. Um, and just to dive to the bottom, uh, the main recommendation, we did not find a large share of the surveyed executives to be um, familiar with or extremely interested in the culture of health notions. So there's a, uh, there's a, a, a uh, influence challenge ahead of us in terms of making sure that uh, businesses uh, understand this and then that it makes sense to them. Um, we found the least amount of interest in smaller businesses uh, with larger mid-sized businesses, a larger target. In terms of our activities, the, uh, the, the MOOC and the two on-site trainings we uh, deliberately chose to try to get a diverse audience to see what we could learn from uh, the different segments. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are an overview. This is an overview of the uh, MOOC program that we did. Uh, the MOOC program went live in May 2018 and went for about nine weeks through the first week of August. Um, it uh, did a, an official rerun between uh, April 2019 um, up through early this year. Uh, people are still able to go on to either HarvardX or edX and find the program. Just uh, search improving your business through a culture of health and you get there pretty easily. Um, we have some of the stats in terms of the number of people who signed up and took part, of course, you get a very large number of signups. We have pretty substantially over 20,000 people who signed up. There are, as we know in the MOOC business, a lot fewer people who go through the whole piece, go through the whole nine hours of content, uh, take their certificate and, uh, and run with it in whether, whatever way they might. Uh, the Harvard X people tell us that they were uh, very happy with the performance of this program uh, in comparison with a lot of their other. Uh, we had a, uh, I, can we move to the next slide? I think we have some, uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is our kind, this was our image for the program. Um, this is a happy town, we call it, uh, but this is something that the Harvard X team came up with uh, to um, be our, our, uh, our, our image for the program. Can we move on? Next slide. And uh, hmm. let me, I'm sorry, let me move back two slides if I can. One more, there we go, okay. 
So again, here's the, uh, here's the data for it. We found that we had a heavy international audience. We had about uh, one third of enrollees from the United States. We actually had two thirds of enrollees from outside the United States. Our second biggest participating country was uh, India. Um, we have found that we have, we set up the program so people don't have to just go through the whole nine hours. People can pick and choose. So if there's a particular hour that you're interested in, then you can go and you can look and see what the content is. And then you can even pick and choose within the hour. So we have, for example, uh, videos of both uh, Paul Terry and Nico Prant at uh, various points. Paul obviously under the employee health pillar um, and uh, Nico under the uh, community pillar as well. So, um, so uh, interesting results, a lot of activity, a lot of dialogue among the learners on the discussion board as it goes through. And uh, it's still up. Uh, we think that Harvard X is pleased with it. We think it'll be up there for a while, but so people can talk about it, discuss it, take a look at it, recommend it to others with confidence that we think it will be uh, available and uh, available for free. People can pay a small amount of money if they'd like to get a fancy certificate at the end of it, um, but that's only when it's running live. Uh, other times people can just go, and again, they can go through the whole nine hours or pick and choose as they, uh, as they choose. And people can even take it and use it for a classroom teaching um, or for presentations or for whatever they find of value. So that is our, that's our MOOC. So let's move on. Two slides. Yeah, here we go. I'm sorry, back one. Here we go, okay. So these are our two leader programs. We did two in person on campus. Um, one in May 2019 and one in September of 2019. Uh, this first one was the one for individual business leaders. Uh, we had uh, 10 contributing faculty, including Paul Terry. Uh, we uh, almost reached our target of 45 participants. We had some late cancellations and had some people on the waiting list at the time of the program. Uh, next slide. This is our brochure that we used to uh, our, our hand, both uh, digital and, uh, and hard copy that we used to advertise uh, both programs. Um, it was our hope that the second program for teams would be uh, populated from businesses that were represented in the first program, the program for individuals. So we hoped that some of the people would be so enthused by what happened in May that they would form teams and then come back in the fall for the team-based program. And that actually happened. Uh, every one of the 10 or so teams that we had in the second program all came from uh, people who were there as individuals in the first. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is the overview of the team's program. Um, and again, it resembled the first, although we made significant changes along the way in response to the evaluation feedback that we got from participants. Uh, and we had, we had 11 teams from 10 organizations. Uh, again, we had a waiting list for it. And, uh, and it was a, it was a uh, very compelling experience. Next slide, please. Uh, here's our summary evaluation. Of, uh, of the three programs, the MOOC, the uh, number two, the executive leaders program for individuals, and then three, the executive teams. Uh, we got overall program evaluation between 4.37, 4.72, which out of five, which is good to very good for a first run program. Uh, once we have our feet wet and really know how to do the programs. We really like to get them up over 4.7 or over 4.8. Uh, that's our goal, but you can see. Um, we initially intended for programs two and three that we were going to charge people to come at uh, standard executive education program rates. 
uh, we were not able to make that work. And so we opened up the programs and essentially used our grant funding from Robert Wood Johnson to run the program so we could learn from the experience of doing it. But in terms of one of our program goals, which was to uh, demonstrate whether or not there's a paying audience for this, uh, I'd have to say that was, um, that was a uh, hypothesis not proven. Um, and if anything, a little bit discouraging uh, because we were not able to attract um, a paying audience. Uh, once we were not able to do it for program two, we didn't charge for program three. So just to uh, put that out there. And um, I think you can see some of the, uh, some of the evaluation scores um, on uh, evaluation of the program willingness to pay and then some of the other feedback. We had a lot more feedback, but in this, for this purpose of this presentation, we wanted to put it into one concise slide. Um, next uh, slide, please. And so here are just, I think this is the last slide. These are some of our takeaways. Um, we know we can recruit a robust audience when the participant cost is zero. Of course, it's not completely zero because the participants, particularly the teams, have to pay their travel and lodging expenses as well as time off from their employment. So there is a cost to participants and to the companies. Um, but uh, when, when we offer it no tuition, um, we're able to fill it. We were not able to prove, at least at this point, that there is a paying business audience for a program such as this. Of course, uh, uh, another facet to that is you know, we are a school of public health. We had uh, good involvement from the business school, but it was the school of public health that was the sponsor and the producer of this program. Uh, you know, one of our um, untested, unproven hypotheses is whether or not we would have done better with a paying audience had the uh, source and the producer of the program been a business school. Um, our evaluation results we think are typical for first run courses, which is a, uh, a good sign with room for improvement. Um, the um, audiences were a mix. We had both uh, for-profit, non-profit, government groups. Um, interestingly, the highest evaluations we got were some of the subgroups that had the least ability to pay. Um, we think that there is in particular interest in a hybrid format that includes some MOOC and some in-person activities. We attempted to make the work in these programs as experiential as we could so that particularly in the Teams program, people were constantly on their feet, uh, working together uh, and uh, applying. Our goal was not to have a didactic program where we just lecture at people. Our goal was to allow participants to get their hands dirty applying the Quelch Four Pillars framework to their own organizations, and then as much as possible, develop over the course of the two days, a set of activities, goals, uh, hypotheses, opportunities that participants could then bring back to their own organization. Um, we can't say this can thrive as a self-sustaining revenue generating product um, marketed to the public. Um, we do think that we have demonstrated that we've got a program that people actually find value, but uh, more, uh, more research, more experimentation would be necessary to really make this go. I think that's my last slide. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's my last slide. So I will Thank stop you. there so we have ample time for- Thank you, Dr. McDonough. We've got several um, comments and questions here that have come up. Um, we have some folks who participated in the MOOC and um, uh, one comment enjoyed the MOOC and would like to see Chambers of Commerce be involved in taking and promoting the course. And then a follow up about the Chambers. I could see Chambers helping to form a local learning community with accountability along with broader business and public health linkages, including, including workforce development groups that many counties have. Has there been any engagement with Chambers of Commerce and trying to get them engaged in the MOOC? We had, um, we had Elise Cohen uh, right. from the Chamber of Commerce Foundation, US Chamber of Commerce Foundation, who was uh, involved in the 
overall projects advisory committee. Uh, and uh, she was helpful in, in helping us to get the word out to let folks know um, about these programs and uh, gave us some good feedback uh, along the way. Um, but we, have, we didn't really uh, uh, work through any organization in a structured way. And of course, that would be an opportunity potentially for the future. Um, so Mava writes, John, I really, really love this. And it resonates well with what we have seen in our work. One thing we found very helpful is to depict the pillars as, con as a connected Mobius strip with each of them as one of the four elements of the loop, just as a comment. I, I appreciate it. If you have a, if you have a um, illustration of that, a pictorial one, I'd love to see it just to uh, visualize it and, uh, and, and, and maybe we can uh, apply it. I, I, think, I think we all at, at Harvard, we all recognize we love John Quelch and appreciate the model and just find actually that the core metaphor of the pillars um, is probably uh, not the most apt for the purposes of what we're trying to do. John Ichoma, um, the funny thing is we had sort of in a set of other conversations recreated almost exactly the same buckets. And when we were doing this with another audience, it, was, it had exactly the same conversation about pillars or a sequence. And I uh, remember George Isham being a big part of saying it can't be that. And then the idea of a, a Mobius strip, which we was mutually reinforcing among them, became really useful at helping um, groups actually align their assets and show that it can be, uh, th that this can be about using your existing assets, resources, and investments far more strategically together to create a balanced portfolio. So I'd be happy to share that. Absolutely, love to, love to see your Mobius strip. Absolutely, please send Joma, it thank you. Sorry about the mispronunciation of your name. Jody said that as someone who's completed and was certified in the MOOC, she has not had any follow-up from Harvard and it might be nice to create a champions among certified alumni to support a greater promotion of the program and create a learning community to keep the dialogue going. Uh, great suggestion um, and uh, you know, we have the uh, evaluation um, uh, material from the program, but uh, we did not have the, we, we, we uh, committed to doing the MOOC, putting it out there and then evaluating. Uh, we haven't uh, come up with uh, follow on or next steps in terms of the uh, MOOC beyond uh, the contacts that we're getting from individuals and groups who participated in it. How is your work connected with Shine? at the Harvard School? Um, Eileen McNeely is one of the uh, presenters in our MOOC, um, and she is uh, deeply involved. Maybe Howard could talk about this a little bit more. She's been central to our work here at Harvard for the past uh, four years or so. Howard, do you want to add anything about that? Sure, thanks, John. So Dr. McNeely uh, is the director of SHINE. She has been a leader in talking about sustainability as a a very important theme relevant to culture of health. And so she's been part of our grant from the beginning, directs Shine as well. We've had events together with, with Shine. And then since her name is mentioned, she uh, has helped to promote the flourishing index in businesses to see if that's a useful monitoring tool. So that, that's been a very valuable research. And then last but certainly not least, uh, she and other colleagues Jack Spengler, Molly Finn, and others have, have worked to reach out to major automobile companies in, in the United States to see what their future thoughts are about sustainability and culture of health. So that's the project that uh, Robert what Johnson is very interested in. So I think plays many roles in, in our projects. Great. Meg asks, how would you measure the success of these programs? Where and what have been the greatest impact? Well, since uh, there was really very little in terms of uh, partnership at the beginning, certainly at Harvard, uh, b before this grant began, began, our two schools rarely, if ever, talked to each other. Now we have uh, very rich collaborations across the two schools. So uh, John and I and Sarah Singer and Amy Edmondson and others, Rob Huckman, uh, George Serafin, we're very, very pleased to have that ongoing collaboration. So that, that's one level. Uh, we're very happy to put out some initial publications to try to talk about the potential here uh, and also the challenges, of course. And we're, we're happy to add to some initial 
academic thoughts about how best to measure outcomes, and then also to do a benchmarking survey, the Melvin quarterly publication from Professor Singer's group that I pushed, uh, put forward in the presentation. But we're, we're just at the beginning here, and uh, th this is a long, long journey. So um, we are very grateful to the Academy, uh, National Academy of Medicine for putting together this action collabor collaborative, because I think we all have a lot more work uh, going forward. Uh, I am very pleased also, by the way, that uh, John mentioned Nico and uh, Paul Terry, and I just want to salute them too. They have, they have both been pioneers in this area for a long, long time, and having them on the advisory council as well as with uh, having Alina has, has been very, very helpful to us. Thank you so much. Um, from Kathy, can you comment on the connection of the research showing limited interest from business overall, especially small business, and the inability to attract a paying audience to the course? Yeah, it's, it's interesting and it's, it's something I think that's a challenge to the larger culture of health ecosystem and, uh, and universe. Um, but uh, the, the, the familiarity from the business community with the term culture of health, not among the, not among the folks who like participants in this collaborative are deeply engaged and committed, but we, did, we didn't find a huge familiarity or understanding of the concept of culture of health going in. And so when we went in and approached and said, hey, come and learn about how to apply culture of health in your business, um, there were people who were scratching their heads saying, well, we don't even know what this is, so why do we know we should apply it to our business? And we said, well, come in and learn because that's, that's what we did with uh, Howard's wonderful uh, first hour where he and Amy Edmondson kind of gave the whole rationale and, and the background to it. But, um, I, you know, I think it's fair to say, you know, there, there's a lot of, as, as the next question mentioned, there's a lot of measures trying to get at the involvement of business and the impact of business on different elements of society beyond return to shareholders. And culture of health is one and ESG, SDG represent others. And I, we, weren't, we weren't impressed with the broad awareness in the business community of these ways of looking at these organizations, the, the, the corporations and how they do it. And so we think there's a lot more actual work to be done to kind of plant the seeds if we're in this for the long, long term, um, and to create some more awareness, I, I think there's, I think there's a uh, legitimate um, questioning and dialogue about, you know, culture of health versus ESG versus the other measures that are out there, and which is the which is the right approach. I think it's a it's bordering on sometimes a little bit of a Tower of Babel of all the different measures out there right now. If people trying to measure essentially the same thing with different instruments and uh, and hope we're not contributing too much to that ourselves here. But I think it indicates that there's uh, some substantial work to be done in terms of the basics of introducing the corporate business community to this whole notion and concept. If I can add to that, uh, and I think John is touching on a very important theme that we've discussed quite a bit in the opening years of our grant. How can we establish a common language between the public health and business communities so that we're all talking about the same thing? So if you talk to an automobile executive, for example, and, and ask, are you interested in culture of health? Are you doing anything for culture of health? They may scratch their head, as John indicated. But if you say to them, are you interested as an auto leader of decreasing carbon emissions, uh, improving automobile safety, decreasing deaths from car accidents, moving toward electric vehicles, they'll say, absolutely, yes. And those are all fundamental to culture of health and uh, sustainability in the long term. So uh, we are finding that as we have these interactions with the business community, that a lot of the themes are similar and common, but the way we're describing it is different. So developing a common language and a common way of measuring outcomes is, is one of the major goals of this whole area in the future. There are a couple more questions um, before we have just a couple minutes left. 
Um, is there any focus on training on the changing nature of work, the employee employer contract and employment generally in the future? Um, and as, as well as what about taking the content and deliver it through other channels where businesses are, are, are already that are already engaging businesses rather than a standalone course? So, um, so for the second one first, so we are, we designed this program so that people could grab and use anything in it, even like just a 30 second clip, if that's what they <clears throat> found helpful for their purposes. So we're totally open to that and welcoming uh, whatever ways we can be helpful. We can pull in a Harvard X to help as well. But uh, the intent was that uh, this content could be swallowed whole and done all together or uh, taken and used in any of a variety of contexts. And we do have some examples of that, but I don't think I have enough time. In terms of focusing on the nature of work, um, you know, what we have found overwhelmingly about 50% of the people who came to both programs uh, came with their, their, their orientation in the employee pillar and, uh, and, uh, and, and then split the other three among the other 50%. And so that's where, that's where a lot of it starts. Everybody comes in, everybody who came to our programs came in feeling solidly grounded in one of the pillars uh, the employee one was the most, and so that's where a lot of these conversations start. But as it starts there, then uh, light bulbs start to go off with people thinking about how some of these things may apply in some of the other pillars. That's great. Um, as you can see in the chat box, there are several other references and resources. Shoma has provided us with a website about well-being in the nation measures. Um, and there was a question about partnering more closely with the business school the Harvard Center for Work, Health, and Well-Being has a conceptual model for promoting and protecting worker health. And perhaps you could tell us very quickly how much discussion is there with that center. Yeah, we are very fortunate to have colleagues at our university, Professor Glorian Sorensen, Dr. Greg Wagner, others who have thought about total worker health. Uh, Professor Lisa Berkman, not, not officially a member of our grant, but a very uh, dear colleague of ours that has spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And, and then also related to well-being at work for employees, uh, back to the flourishing index, uh, Dr. Van de Weel and Dr. McNeely are looking to see how the flourishing outcomes differ by various employee policies. So if, if you have access to uh, parental leave benefits, for example, or telecommuting, for example, or you're enjoying a so-called culture of safety, psychological safety, uh, a theme that Professor Edmondson has championed in her research. How, how does that impact employee wellness outcomes? Th these are some of the research issues that we're exploring through our grant efforts. Well, I want to thank both of you so much. Both of you have mentioned the great work of Dr. Nico Pronk. He is actually going to be the speaker for our next webinar for all of you on the line, which is scheduled for March 19th at noon Eastern time. And Dr. Pronk will be talking about a business oriented perspective on the federal healthy people effort. I did put in the chat, the two email addresses, Dr. McDonough's email address, J M uh, J McDonough, M-C-D-O-N-O-U-G-H at shph.harvard.edu. And uh, K Vonda, V as in Victor, A N D A, at hsph.harvard.edu for Dr. Koh's slides. Um, I'm sure that um, uh, Alina and Carla can assist us if, if any of the other links, uh, you were not able to catch any of the other links on the discussion chat. But thank you all for being here, Dr. Koh, Dr. McDonough. Thank you for your excellent presentation. And you're right, this is just the beginning, it's a long journey to link these issues together. And um, it's exciting that we're still all working on them together. So thank you for your time today. And thank you everyone for, for being on today's webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you.